Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Hector Bones, Tim Ashman, and Johnny Hernandez. Coming up on DTNS, are Twitch streamers in for a world of hurt? Apple says self-repair is a okay sort of. And when games shut down, what's next for the gamers? <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, April 27th, 2022. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From deep in Dogtown, St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chain. We are going to talk about all of the things in tech today, but let's start okay. with a few tech things you should know about. In its Q1 earnings report, Alphabet earned $25.62 per share on revenue up 23% on the year to $68.01 billion. However, both missed analyst expectations. Overall revenue growth in Europe slowed to 19% in Q1 compared to 33% last year. YouTube ad revenue came in under analyst estimates with $6.87 billion. Google Cloud grew revenue 44% on the year to $5.82 billion. That beat analyst ex estimates. Other bets revenue, that includes Waymo, among others, increased revenue 122% to $440 million, while the units lost remained flat on the year at $1.15 billion. DJI will temporarily suspend business in Russia and Ukraine to ensure its products are not used in combat, calling it a statement about our principles. This makes DJI the first major Chinese firm to cite the ongoing conflict for halting sales in Russia. The Google Play Store began rolling out its privacy-related nutrition labels to apps, which will appear in the new Google Play data safety section. These sections will show which data is collected, if it's shared with a third party, and security practices for data. Developers must submit data, data safety section details by July 20th. Spotify reported its Q1 revenue rose 24% year over year to 2.66 billion euros, including 282 million euros from ads, up 31% year over year, with paying subscribers rising 15% year over year to 182 million. However, the company lost 1.5 million in Russia after pulling its service from the country and warns it will lose another 600,000 subscribers in the current period. Spotify's paid subscriber forecast for the current quarter fell just short of analyst estimates. Google began testing display ads in YouTube short content. The company says initial test ads will likely be for app installs and other promotions. YouTube reported average daily views of shorts increased over four times on the year in its Q1 to 30 billion. All right, Patrick, let's talk a little bit about being a streamer and how it sucks. Wow. <laughs> how, how it could potentially suck depending on who you are and what you're looking for. Where your revenue is coming from. Okay, so Bloomberg sources say Twitch began considering proposals to revamp its payment structure. One proposal could cut top streamer subscription revenue share from 70% down to 50%. Another would potentially create multiple tiers with different requirements that would incentivize broadcasters to run more ads for unsubscribed viewers. Twitch could potentially drop exclusivity terms for members of its partner programming, letting them stream on other services, i.e. we're going to cut your revenue, but you can stream it elsewhere at the same time and we won't cut you off. On the surface, you might say, well, isn't this bad for streamers? I guess it really depends on the streamer. Um, Twitch changes might offer more freedom and with a less lucrative pay structure, Twitch could drop. Uh, I mean, if they, oh boy, this seems like a big messy balancing act. I'm losing money from Twitch, but I can pick up money over here. But do I have any people who will watch me over here? Or can I get traction over here? It really all depends on what happens with the partner program and streaming on uh, rival services, I guess, on Facebook Gaming or YouTube. Twitch is not commenting on the report, but the rumored proposals are coming after Twitch implemented multiple efforts to boost long-term profits and satisfy its parent company, Amazon. Twitch recently launched a program meant to get prolific streamers to run more ads, i.e. we need more money. Give us more money. We need more money. How about more money? Give us more money. I, <laughs> I you know, I, I, I keep thinking. You know, did Amazon buy Twitch because they thought it was going to be the next big thing or did they buy Twitch because Google wanted it and therefore they were going to try to deny it from Google? And boy, Gosh, uh, yeah, I mean, probably <laughs> pro probably both. I mean, Twitch is a big thing. Uh, Twitch yeah. is, you know, it's 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 certainly something that I, I, I would think parent company Amazon is 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 happy to have under its umbrella. 
that said, when I first read this news this morning, I was like, oh man, I mean, I, you know, I know we stream on uh, our show on Twitch and, you know, we, we're, we're not unfamiliar with revenue, revenue streams from being on Twitch, but, uh, the idea that you as a streamer and somebody who's, you know, this is you know, maybe not full time or maybe it is full time mm -hmm. or maybe more like 20 hours a day. I don't know. Like however crazy you want to be about uh, live streaming, if this is your bread and butter, anything that a company says is like, well, OK, your 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 share is going to drop. However, you have more freedom to go other places. What that tremendous doesn't sound opportunity great. we have for you. It just, yeah, doesn't, whole... it just doesn't sound great. And may maybe you are a streamer who's who's felt like, you know, I wish I didn't have exclusivity. I wish I could, you know, try things out, you know, with, with several platforms, kind of see where my audience is or see where the audience differs. That is very legit. But not everybody feels that way. So if you're a person who has said, no, I've I've really... I've, I've really invested a lot of time, energy, and, you know, my own money in some cases to be on this particular platform. Right. Changes like this get scary. And certainly I don't think, I don't think you're ever going to run to anybody, whether they're a streamer or a YouTuber or an Instagrammer or, or whatever label you want to slap on them. Nobody wants to hear the phrase, we're going to reduce your revenue ever, or we're going to reduce your share. Nobody wants to hear that. Um, and I think it's, even more problematic is, you know, uh, how many people really make money off of Facebook whose names don't end with Zuckerberg? Uh, right. You know what I mean? Like the, the the content on Facebook has never turned out to be. I let me rephrase this. I think there are very rare examples of people making money off of generating content or streaming content on Facebook. Perhaps this has changed and I'm simply unaware of it. Feel free to let me know, tweet at Patrick Norton. But uh, for the most part, I think this has got to be frustrating for, for Twitch streamers. And it's going to be interesting to see how they react if this story even turns out to be true. Because part of this is one of those things like, oh, you you know, Amazon's trying to figure out if everyone will leave Twitch if they <laughs> reduce their revenue. Let's see the story and see what kind of response we get. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who works with, I mean, not only do I produce my own podcast, but, but uh, people who, you know, work mm -hmm. on podcasts. And I get this question a lot of, okay, where do we live? You know, what what's our platform? What do we choose? What's the best place? And I always kind of go, it's really up to you. It, you know, it, you have yeah. to build an audience and you can build an audience in multiple places that requires more work, just plain and simple. It's going to require more work. You might end up benefiting more by doing that, but let's not, you know, mince words here. It's going to be more work for you. <laughs> so, you know, that's, it's one of those things where I, you know, I, I kind of go, okay, Amazon, I, I, I see you. <laughs> I get it. Opportunity rhymes with exposure. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, well, Mac Rumors is reporting that Apple launched its much anticipated self service repair program today for the iPhone 12, the iPhone 13, and the third gen iPhone SE in the United States. The company plans a European launch of the program later this year. The program, in its detail, will provide access to genuine repair manuals and over 200 Apple parts and tools through the self repair a self-service repair store. To initiate a self-repair, as a customer, you need to review the appropriate product repair manual, uh, specific repair process on the website. Then they'll, as a, as somebody who wants to repair something, you'll be allowed to purchase those required parts. You kind of go, yeah, yeah, I've seen it. I know what I'm doing. Please give it to me. In a blog post today, iFixit's Elizabeth Chamberlain commented on Apple's self-service repair program, saying it was a great step for self-repair, but had one major issue. Users repairing their iPhones must have a valid IMEI or their phone's serial number. Then that part must be paired with the phone. Mac Rumors reports that the pairing process, known as system configuration, will require customers to contact the self-service repair store's support team over chat or by a phone call, and adds that the store is run by a third-party company, Spot, S-P-O-T, not Apple itself. The rest of the blog details iFixit's optimism about the program and the direction that the company is taking to let customers repair their own devices. Patrick, I don't know. I mean, is the idea <laughs> that Apple isn't really running this program themselves concerned to you? Uh, no. 
that part doesn't concern me so much. I mean, it's it's more. Uh, okay, first of all, let me say this flat out: <laughs> Apple making parts and repair manuals public is awesome. I feel like this is what uh, the entire crew at iFixit, you know, Kyle Ween's inspiration for starting iFixit was simply the fact that he just wanted to repair his stupid MacBook. Um, I, my words, not his. Um, you know, I was also digging into the manuals that Apple had posted and, uh, you know, uh, seeing the heated display removal tool that Apple techs use is fascinating for me. It's like this big stainless steel thing and the phone goes into it and there's slots to adapt different devices into it. Um, uh, but the catch really isn't, you know, big proprietary tools, right? You know, the, Elizabeth said it over at iFixit. You have to supply a serial number to include the part to a phone. So uh, the campaign director for uh, right to repair at the public interest research group, Nathan Proctor, one of the things he pointed out um, is this allows Apple to maintain a lot of control over the repair process. And uh, it also means Apple can decide to stop supporting repairs, right? If these parts will only work, if there's a phone call involved, all they have to do is, is stop answering the phone or change the rules, right? Um, you know, iFixit founder Kyle Weens, his note was like, what if you want to pull the camera from another phone? Nope, you're not allowed. What if you want to buy an app with Market Park? Nope, you're not allowed. It's a very specific set of rules that, that uh, you know, you can, you, you will jump through if you want to do the official Apple self repair system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously these are right to repair activists. I can probably label myself as that. Uh, they want repair to be as open and accessible as possible. And Apple is Apple. Apple likes control. It's part of what Apple does. We could argue about security. You could argue about making sure you have the right part, but essentially this is the terms that Apple laid down for getting parts directly I mean from Apple. Just going back to what you just mentioned about security, is there? Do you think there is a legitimate claim that Apple wants to maintain the homogeneity of their 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 product process or, or product repair process because they want to ensure that their you know their custom crafted you know many developer long uh, process for ensuring that the thing is tight <laughs> as a drum from a security standpoint isn't somehow blemished during this repair process if you're putting a non uh, non authorized part in I feel I, I can understand why Apple would want to block non authorized parts but then again there are lots of of, of you know ways around that dot 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 that said, does Apple not supply their trust their own supply chain? I feel like mo it's more if you were if you wanted to argue about why Apple wants you to call. Uh, okay, maybe they want to make sure it's the right part for your phone, and an easy way to do that is to tie it into the hardware serial number or the IMEI. Um, you know, maybe they want to gather information. Maybe they want to prevent it from being used in certain ways. Who knows? It's not like Apple's going to suddenly you know, put out a giant press release going, this is the reason why we set up the system this way and our justification or lack yeah. of justification. You know what I mean? Like this, this is, this is not the Apple way. Um, right. Right. You know what I mean? This, this is the company that told me, no, 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 we don't have a design issue within our antenna. You have an issue with the way you hold your phone. Right. I mean, literally that was, you know, you, our antenna isn't broken. You're holding the phone wrong. What? You know what I mean? Apple's a, interesting company um i also uh, you know i thought it was also interesting right i mentioned the heated display removal tool i think at some point in here um the heat gun so yeah no 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 no, no it's 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 gun. actually a big fixture a big device like an appliance like something that would go next to your coffee maker and blend right in um so you can purchase that for 256 dollars, and it's like 108 bucks for the different display pockets that plug into that or you can rent something like, for example, I have an iPhone 12. You get an iPhone 12 toolkit. You rent it for seven days for $49. There's a toolkit for each model uh, they support, and it's packed with all the tools you need, uh, you know, that they mentioned basically in the manual. Uh, I like the part that was to avoid the non-return fee, drop it off at a UPS store by day seven. There's no mention of what the non-refer fee is, but I think it's essentially the sum total of everything that's in the Pelican case. Um you know, and it's interesting to look at, right? Because it, it looks much more convenient than my long-suffering iFixit eye opener um, and a stack of guitar picks, or, you know, I call them guitar picks. They're essentially the, the blue picks that come in the box with uh, iFixit products. I mean, that's essentially a sock filled with media. You heat it in the microwave, you put it down on the screen, you get the pick under there, you get it open, you move it down, you heat it up again. So having a big thing where you put it in place and it's officially Apple sanctioned and Apple gives you the instructions, I think that'll be 
attractive for a lot of people. So I think there's a balance here. I think this may open up self-repair to a lot of people who wouldn't consider it before because Apple products are expensive, just like everything mm-hmm. else in life. Uh, and I think also it will, you know, make everybody working for right to repair that much more intense about taking it to the next level and making it that much easier. I mean, as somebody who, you know, full disclosure, dropped her iPhone in the toilet this morning briefly, Hate but that. I did, but I did. Hate that feeling. It's a thing that happened. It hasn't happened in years. I really thought I was better than this. But um, yeah, and I'm and now I'm having iPhone issues. This uh, you know, the the, the uh the repair uh program from Apple isn't necessarily gonna fix anything that's going on with my phone. I might just have to, you know, throw it in a bunch of rice and, and call it a day for a few <laughs> days. But uh I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> it's just yeah. a couple of hours ago. But Anything that gives me a little bit more uh, of my own power to mm-hmm. s- try to make sense of this and to save a little money and learn a little bit in the process. I mean, not everybody wants to open up stuff and learn a little bit right. about what's going on under the hood. But for those that do, this is really big. Or if you just have looked at the costs of having somebody else do it for you or having exactly. it done by Apple, you know, you can look at that because you know, I've, I've, I had a friend of mine who was, who was like adamant, like, I'm going to get a new phone. And he's like, wait, there's nothing I want on the new phone. It's going to cost me $1,200 to get the cool one. And, you know, it was just, it's, it's interesting to watch how people sort of work their way through is repair bad is repair. Good. Do I need repair? You know, if you have, Children with phones suddenly repair becomes much more attractive. Also, armoring phones and screens. Um, you know, I, I'll be very curious to see where this evolves and and if it lasts and holds forward. I mean, I'm glad that they're doing it. I think it's a good step. Yeah, it's a good step. It's a good step. Well, if you feel like this is a good step, or you don't, or you want to hear us talk about something completely different on the show, one way to let us know is in our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them. Uh, really helps us make our rundown every day. So thank you in advance. DailyTechNewsShow.Reddit.com Ubisoft published a list of 91 games that have had online services and multiplayer features shut off since 2021, including Far Cry 2, Splinter Cell, and Just Dance. PC versions of these games lose access to previously unlocked content, although console players keep these as long as they have old game saves. Ubisoft announced plans to shut down services for many of these titles last year. Patrick, what, what, what's happening here? (laughs) Things are aging. Um, (laughs) Companies are going out of business. Servers cost money. I I thought this was an interesting follow-up. Last year, Kotaku wrote, uh, well, it was more of a, 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 you know, a screen show. Uh, 12 games killed in 2021 that prove preservation is vital. And that came out right at the tail end of last year. And uh, not to state the obvious, but I, it suddenly occurred to me that finding old ROMs or keeping a vintage console running or, or what well, my friend Sebastian over at PC Per does, he re- he has vintage DOS hardware to, pay, to play his vintage DOS games because emulation is just not acceptable. Um, this all sounds incredibly manageable or easy if you want to be able to play the games you grew up with. And maybe you don't. Maybe this is silly. But it, it's something I've sort of noticed all over the place, right? Proprietary servers um, or, you know, something that's particularly painful for me, smart hardware that requires apps to run doesn't necessarily age well because, you know, operating system change, apps need to be updated, servers cost money. And, uh, you know, if it's a big, massive server system that's only maintained by the company, there's probably no alternative once they shut that server down. Um, so, you know, feel free to, to, you know, tweet me to say that 12 years of little big planet was more than enough, <laughs> but it's, um, and maybe it was, or maybe you're heartbroken that the servers are gone, but uh, you know, it's not just games, right? Services and servers tied to hardware, especially to IT and smartphones has been really problematic in the last few years uh, because yeah. they require money to run. And when a company goes bankrupt, there's no money for the servers, right? There's a, I think if you're watching the video, you can see the Hackaday article. Uh, Insteon abruptly shuts down users left smart homeless. And, uh, you know, this is, I think it was <laughs> Revolve went down in 2016, uh, Spectrum went down in 2020. Samsung Smart Things went down in 2021. Um, you know, Hackaday's done a bunch of stuff uh, uh, around this. And uh, Giga Stacy on Twitter, she covers the Internet of, of Things or the the, uh, the home automation uh, stuff in great detail. She's actually quoted in the in the Hackaday article. Um, 
you know, this is, you know, it's not just smart homes. One of the things they talk about in uh, Hackaday is like things like prosthetic eyes or other hardware. Sure. It's yeah. kind of wild when you start thinking the more and more we make this stuff connected or the more and more it requires, you know, apps to run, it gets uh, complicated. So. Oh, sorry. I, I, I know I you were saying something, that. Roger. Oh, no, I was, th I was thinking there were – This, I, I, I honestly believe a lot of this has to do with the fact that not everything is standardized. I had yes. – I, 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 was, I was using a router that I bought back in 98, and at some point it just stopped functioning very well as a router, so I used it as a wireless access point. But because it is IP-based, it, it – it routes IPs because that's a standardized technology that everyone sure. uh, adheres to. It worked fine. Granted, it sucked as a router uh, because some something happened to have to have the the, the logic board on it. Um, but it worked for for that purpose. I was still able to squeeze some benefit. But when you orphan a product because something is so uh, so so siloed away from a broader, you know a Tech, uh, broader technology uh, grouping, it kind of it kind of stinks because you invest a lot of money, a lot of time uh, into these things, and when you don't have your smart home system, then you're like, oh, nuts. You know, I was thinking about this as I don't know, comparing to some old classic movie, right? It's like right. I don't know. I mean, pick any movie; doesn't matter. Uh, the, 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 the Night of the Living Dead, and or some Walsh, Chimes at Midnight. Unavailable on any platform, on any sir. It basically was, wasn't even available on EA, VHS for years. Um, one of so the great is, lost hot messes of movie dumb. Yeah, so this does happen, but but much much less of an issue, right? In cinema, it's like, mm -hmm. eh, you can find it somewhere. Uh, you know, maybe you got to do a little digging. Maybe you got to sign up for a particular service. But we don't have these sort of ongoing issues that I feel like have been prevalent in the gaming world, especially lately, of like, where does it all go? You know, what happens when the company just won't support it anymore? Like, it just shuts down. Is, it, could there be some way for there to be like a plex of gaming where you just, you just, you just find the game and it's I fine? Mean, I mean, there is in a way. I mean, there have been, unfortunately, just a handful, not, not a lot, but a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, not a lot of companies that do this or, or, or developers because once the, company splits up the everyone goes to the four winds um there was a game back in the the late 90s called the uh, what was it called it was called uh, free space uh let me see pull the title free space and the, the sequel free space to uh developed by a french company about voliton when that game came to an end they open source the entire uh, mm -hmm. uh, source code so anyone could develop for it and what was fascinating is they not just open source the game itself the op open source the software to run your own server so people uh, you know players who are heavily invested in the game uh would be able to not only you know make mods for the games and keep it alive but they could also maintain servers independently of whatever company that would chose to run it and i'm wondering if it's one of those things where companies should sort of have an end of life roadmap of how they want to do things you know instead of just turning off the lights it's like okay this source code for this game is you know two generations old really no point in keeping it let's open source it we'll give the community all the assets they can handle it you know if they want to develop their own own homebrew servers to to do co-op gaming great we're not we're gonna we're just gonna give it out to the community and then move forward with other stuff <laughs> You know, that would be ideal. Um, it's interesting, right? Because I was thinking about, you know, Slim Devices was bought by Logitech. And then five or six years later, Logitech ended uh, their support or basically stopped manufacturing the hardware. And much like they've done with their remote control systems more recently, they maintained some of the server availability. And, of course, people figured out uh, open source ways of feeding these MP3 streamers, right? Um you know, this isn't exactly new. Um, you know, Home Assistant is is one option. Actually, it's one of the things that's interesting. If you happen to be uh, an Insteon user and you've been freaking out, uh, Stacy on IoT.com, that's Stacy Higginbotham's website. You know, there's a great article up there on some of your alternatives. How do you keep your Insteon stuff running? You know, what's your path forward? Uh, I have several friends, for example, who have had home automation systems um, or household stuff 
go down and then moved on to Home Assist because it, it was an open source tool that allowed them to continue moving things forward. There's much stuff going on, uh, you know, at a, a larger level with some other platforms. But, you know, I'd laugh, right? But my wife just bought a mosquito repeller for us to use this summer, and she had to track down the old version that isn't smart that doesn't use an app to run you know what i mean like i you know i turn it on i turn it off what exactly do i need an app to, am i going to track the number of mosquitoes repelled is it going to give me some is there going to be notifications on my phone um you know and and the overall problem which i think roger you kind of got into is that you know this stuff costs money is there you know is there a way forward you know I mean, how many times have you had to, you know, had an old piece of Windows hardware or something silly that required a driver and there was no driver for Windows 10 or there was no a thousand years ago, no Windows 95 driver for it? Um, you know, you mentioned your Wi-Fi router. I mean, how many Wi-Fi routers must have left? They must have left the factory with flawless firmware that was unhackable because they never got a single update. Uh, sure, that's a possibility. Um, you know, it's... I, it's, I feel like this is all part of a larger problem that's not going away. Yeah, I mean, and, mentally. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it's, it's one of those things. I honestly think if, if product developers could, could have had an open standard to adhere to, right. It would, it would help eliminate all of that. I mean, I had an old IP security camera that after 2000, uh, uh, 2016, you could no longer open its interface on a Mac because Safari wasn't supported, and there were a bunch of hooks that uh, didn't work in Chrome. And so to use it, you had to be on a PC, even though before when yeah. they sold it, it was sold as a uh, Mac PC thing. Eh. Well, we, we, we assume many of you are raising your hand saying, I have thoughts, I have thoughts. And if you do, do send them our way, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. This is probably not the last time we'll be talking about this issue, but matter. Uh, what about we, matter? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> matter. Where is it? Uh, uh, um, if you if you moving into the travel space, if you've built up a lot of travel points, I know I'm one of those people, and I haven't used them in quite some time, and I don't know when I will. Chris Christensen has a handy way, uh, an alternative way to spend those points. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. If you haven't traveled here for a couple of years and you've built up a lot of points and you're trying to figure out a way to use them, but you're not quite ready to travel yet, there are other ways that you can use your points, your travel points. And one way is Amazon. If you Google Amazon Shop with Points, you can see that there are many different point systems that will let you cash that into Amazon dollars. And so American Express membership rewards, for instance, Capital One, Discover, City Cards, Chase Ultimate Rewards, Hilton Honors, or HSBC can all be transferred points from their systems into Amazon, where you can get cool techie stuff. Just thought you should know. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Oh, love it. Love it. Uh, I mean, if you want to spend your points with Amazon, um, certainly certainly a good way to do it. I have a lot of points. What am I going to do? <laughs> am I going to get on a plane? Probably just going to buy some stuff from Amazon. Uh, real quick, uh, Bill from Can It Finally Be Spring, North Dakota? I guess it's not spring there yet, Bill. Bill wrote in and said, I just listened to your episode where you talked about True Bill, and I wanted to give my one and a half cent experience. Sometime during the pandemic, I tried out True Bill and I saw that it would negotiate my, with my cell, pro, cell phone provider, which is Verizon, and help, help lower my bill. Thought that was cool. Gave it a shot. The result was. Verizon saying, if I wanted to lower my cell phone bill, I could lower my data plan. So cue my sarcastic surprise face. Not exactly effective negotiation. I guess with my experience, Truebill has some good promise, but maybe not always effective. Patrick, I don't know if you're familiar with Truebill. We talked about this uh, on yesterday's show, or maybe it was Monday's show. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea of, of having a subscription service to help you manage your subscription services. And this is one of those things I read about and went, hmm. I'll let somebody else try that. And thankfully, Bill tried it. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you know, technically, they did negotiate him a lower rate or give him options that he could have figured out himself without paying a fee. Um, yeah. 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 It, dep you know. yeah, it depends. It depends. I mean, the, the whole idea is that if you were signed up for, I don't know, some streaming service and you weren't using it. 
uh, True Bill would kind of go like, huh, we're noticing that you're not using this. Would you like to cancel or pause the subscription? Save yourself some money. So it, <laughs> it, it's, it's supposed to work uh, well, but uh, as Bill points out, not necessarily for everything that you pay for. It also depends on maybe how organized you are about your subscriptions or how hard you cut your subscriptions off. But yeah, I, I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, subscriptions aside, Patrick Norton, what have you been up to lately and where can people keep up with your work? Oh, goodness. Uh, find out what's going on with me. The latest is usually posted up on Twitter at Patrick Norton. And of course, I'm still doing AV Excel, a weekly podcast about home theater and audio with Robert Heron. We talk about home theater. We talk about televisions. We talk about screens. We talk about headphones. Head on over to AV Excel or search for AV Excel on your favorite podcatcher. Well, it was ha good to have you on the show. Thank you for being with us. Also, want to extend Thank a special you. thanks to Travis Falstad, who is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Travis. We see you. We feel you. There's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. It rolls on right after we wrap up this show. It's also available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Do join us if you can. And just a reminder, we are live. If you can join us live, it's Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back doing it all again tomorrow with Len Peralta and Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>